In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Blessed art thou, Christ our God, who has shown forth the fishermen as supremely wise by sending down upon them the Holy Spirit, and through them didst draw the world into thy net, O lover of mankind. Glory be to thee. Amen. 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 So, Father Jim, can can I be heard? Can you hear me right now? Yep, you're loud and clear. You want to go ahead and make an introduction? Or we lost please. your picture just now. Yes, please, Father Jim, go ahead. Okay, we're blessed uh, today to have Steve Tibbs with us. Steve is um, he's an expert in strategic planning. He's a long, long time parish council member and a, a long time parish council president as well. He's an active member of the Metropolis of San Francisco. Um, he was a presenter at our uh, 2020 National Missions and Evangelism Con Conference in Columbus. And um, he's going to be talking about getting parishioners back to church and engaged in the life of the parish. Um, he has written a book on strategic planning from a parish perspective. And I think he brings a lot as far as our planning because um, things won't be the way they were before, but we need to plan and organize in order to do our best to bring people back to church. Um, Steve, thank you for being with us today. Um, it's all yours. Thank you. It's nice to see you again. I think uh, I do recognize a few faces from when I presented on strategic planning. Oh gosh, what was that, Stacy? About a, a little over a year ago or so, or maybe? Oh yeah. Yeah, a year and a half ago. Yes. So, but it's nice to be back with you. Um, so, what I'd like to do tonight is just to share with you some perspectives and and focus on three areas. Uh, one is just providing a common context of what we've seen and what we're experiencing today. And then also what we learned during the pandemic uh, as Orthodox churches. And then also uh, give some tips on going forward. Uh, now I fully recognize that, and as we know, uh, the first contextual piece is that this was a very difficult process or situation to manage and the fact that our metropolises uh, were, are, are spread out over so many different states and each state seemed to have its own uh, regulations uh, on how to handle the pandemic and then when you got into counties and even cities uh, that changed as well. So uh, with that in mind as we rebuild the same holds true. So as states are opening, they don't open all consistently within a metropolis. And certainly my paradigm being in California will be different with yours if you're in Ohio or uh, you know, any other state. Even within the metropolis of San Francisco, we have seven states, each one running on, if you will, a different cylinder. So that has challenged the, the process. So in the, in the metropolis of San Francisco, uh, we have majority of our parishes are fully open. Uh, we have two states that are marginally open. Uh, and then we have one, it's actually parish in Hawaii, that's tough to get to with all of their COVID restrictions. But once you're there, it's fairly open. So it's it's a, kind of a mixed bag. Uh, so let me share with some slides tonight. It, is, it will be a slide-based uh, presentation. Uh, I'll go as, as quickly as I can. So there's a few slides and uh, I think, uh, you know, Father Jim and Stacy have bought the 25 slide package. Uh, we're going to give you about a 30 slide package. Uh, but uh, again, focusing in on context, lessons learned and some recommendations uh, to consider going forward. Uh, so if I can, let me share these uh, slides with you. And we'll be off and running. Uh, by the way, uh, these slides will be available. Uh, to you. Uh, Stacy will have the final slides. So let me open this up. All right. And there we go. So let's start with the title, the post-pandemic parish and then getting parishioners back to church. You know, I that's kind of the, the introduction, but really it's not getting parishioners back to church. It's really bringing our parishioners forward to the fullness of the faith. Uh, just like when we said our churches were closing, our church was never closed. 
we just limited participation and removed people from the fullness of the faith, being able to experience the Eucharist. And what we want to be able to do now is reverse that and have people return to the really the fullness of the faith. And we'll be talking about that a little bit more. So that's really the focus of this. Uh, let's look back a little bit uh, in order to look forward. And if you look at our the COVID journey a year in a glance in in April 2020, I can I can recall sitting down on my parish at St. Paul's uh, uh, in Irvine, California, and uh, I can remember sitting down with the parish council probably in about February and having early discussions about uh, you know what should we do? Should we cancel our annual Easter fellowship picnic on the grounds because certainly you know, Pasca is not going to get canceled in 2020. Uh, and then it was like, well, unless we face that is certainly we're going to, the thing's going to die out in summer and we'll be able to do our fall festival. Of course, we know how that played out as well. And so it was, this was this rapid yet slow reveal on what the plans were. And so we had the normal in 2020. Many parishes, I assume many of your parishes, immediately jumped into contingency planning, looking at their finances, reducing budgets, uh, maybe recalibrating the expectation from stewardship programs or fundraising. And really the parish pivoted immediately to say, okay, here's how we're gonna pare things down, but also here's how we're gonna care for one another. And the caring then was taking care of shut-ins, making sure that they had food because we didn't know what the food supply, food supply chain was going to be or be impacted, making sure people had toilet paper, uh, making sure that people had uh, access to medications. So it was very common to see many phone trees go into action, people calling, checking in, uh, showing concern for their fellow parishioners. And that was a, a wonderful, positive uh, thing to be able to do. Uh, but uh, we simply didn't know how far along this was going to go. And then once we hit the winter of 2020, uh, we were you know, deep into uh, the, the pandemic. Um, annual plans, uh, annual processes we thought never would be changed in our parishes, like parish council elections, uh, fall general assemblies, those sort of things took on a completely different look parish by parish. Of course, under the guidance of, of uh, the archdiocese, allowing flexibility for that. We had general assemblies for the first time online. We had some general assemblies that just didn't happen. So we, we had to, again, use that word pivot to uh, respond to the situation best we could. Now we're into the spring and through this period, thank God, the, the numbers have dropped significantly. Uh, we seem to be getting back to normalcy in our lives whatever normal is. And now we're looking at the churches and we don't know what the new normal is today. Uh, some metropolises have been very specific in what has reopened in terms of liturgical practices and social gatherings at their parishes. Some, as I mentioned, by states are still um, trying to figure that out or being a little slower. But we are now talking all parishes are now talking about how do we re-engage our parishioners? And that's what we're going to talk about a little further. So in looking at this bell curve, this inverse bell curve, right in the center in, in the winter, we were at a significant inflection point. Inflection is when the, the, curvature, of the, of the curvature significantly departs from normal. And we, to a, a large degree, are still in that inflection period. As a matter of fact, there's a, another term for it I like to use, is that we are now in the liminal stage. Those of you that uh, have an anthropological background will know that uh, in societal, in society and groups and within individuals, uh, the notion of a liminal stage is one when a person enters a certain stage or an organization even as a collection of behaviors, enters a certain stage of disorientation, of ambiguity, where they kind of feel out of sorts, where the old doesn't work any longer. An example of that would be college graduation, when you don't have a job lined up, 
all of a sudden you knew what your schedule was and then you don't have a schedule anymore. You were at the top of your class. Now you don't have a class around you. People that go in retirement face this. Some move through it very quickly. Some linger a long period of time. The first thing that happens is that there's a separation. If you look at that bell curve, that inverse bell curve we talked about, that's what happened to all of our parishes. All of a sudden we had this immediate separation and all of our parishioners that were connected to ministries. And as you know, that there are parishioners that identify specifically and are identified in their parish by the ministry in which they're associated or lead. Uh, this person has always been the director of Sunday school. This person has always been an active Philoctohos member. This person has always run the, the local soup kitchen, whatever the case might be. And in a blink of an eye, all that went away to a certain degree. Parish council stayed intact. Philoctohos was very busy uh, checking up on those in need and those sort of things. But many parishioners, many of our ministry leads went through the separation of identity of what to do. In addition, we had some chanters that couldn't come in and chant. We certainly had choir members that were completely stripped of identity because they could no longer go into the church. So now we're, we're still in this period, this liminal stage, this in-between period. We're looking at new possibilities. Our old status has shifted. And if we're normal human beings, what we'd like is we'd like everything to go back the way it was because we love status quo. In some cases, that status quo will be fine. We can continue back into our old roles, but we haven't gotten there yet. And that's why we need to have a plan in place. So this reorientation, that's what I'm gonna be suggesting a little bit later, that we have to identify some new, new, into, new identities for our ministries. Maybe we create new ministries, maybe we create new processes. So we're not, let's say smack dab in the middle of a liminal stage, but we're hopefully getting into the reorientation period. Once we reorient, once that college student gets a job or goes back to school, then they recalibrate, they appreciate where they came from, and then they have a new identity. I'm now you know, a master's degree student. I now have this job, whatever the case might be. So we have a lot of ministry leads that are, are trying to figure that out. The history of our church is full of examples of people exiting a liminal stage for positive. Moses leaving his position, leading the people into the leading his people into the desert. He left behind what he knew in his status and had to reorient himself. Paul on the road to Damascus, having a, a very substantial role and position and and uh, well, hatred of Christians, and then being blinded and reorienting himself into a new direction. And certainly Christ himself, after his baptism being in the desert for 40 days before returning for his ministry in Galilee. This reorientation periods, we've known those in our church. Those of you that have been involved in a parish moving its location uh, have gone through that same situation. Uh, to a certain degree, when we have a new priest come into the parish, there's that reorientation as well. So again, the church is, has examples of throughout history. And the fact of the matter is the church has been challenged, as we know, all during history. This is our opportunity to further lead and be part of the uh, continued establishment and offerings within our church. Our church is not dead. Uh, just uh, you know, We just need to uh, figure out a way to connect it and have it connect the bull to people who have left. And that's a real key element as well. The areas that of uh, looking at this liminal stage, as I mentioned ministries, our worship is intact. Our worship has not changed. Our, our hopefully our personal faith formation, our prayer life uh, has not changed. Certainly the ability to receive communion for a long period was, was challenged. Uh, our leadership was challenged in a way it operated. Our operating culture, our parish culture, for a large element, kind of went away because no one was there. And what I'm seeing with parishes that are returning, they are, for the most part, returning to their prior culture, which is the combined behaviors of the parish. 
vision, that suffering, because in some cases we, we don't know what the vision of the parish is going to be and needs to be reset. But the areas that really changed and modified, and this is a, an operating model I use for strategic planning called the Orthodox Parish, the Living House of Faith. This area, these areas in here, fundraising and stewardship, as you all know, as, as leaders of your stewardship programs, took a significant modification over this past year. Uh, the way that we ran our facilities, capital improvement projects that were placed on hold, or some parishes took the opportunity to initiate and complete capital improvement projects uh, as nobody was in church, so it was easy, easy to do some remodeling. But our ministries and our parish systems are two areas that were significantly impacted and are now coming out of uh, this liminal stage. So again, our core elements haven't changed, our belief system, our worship, our, our ethos as Orthodox, but our ministries and our, the way that we connect uh, have significantly altered. I do want to talk about, when we talk about the post-pandemic parish, uh, it's multidimensional. Certainly there's the worship element. Technology has certainly risen. Um, how we interact as parishioners, and you can see this is highlighted because that's the focus of tonight, how do we get parishioners back to church? Our health and safety. What does our health and safety look like going forward? Uh, and I'll, I'll talk about that in a little bit more. Certainly our ministries, as I've alluded to, our finances, our stewardship, all those things have changed. Going back to technology, probably the most significant things that's changed is technology. Uh, one of the things that uh, parishes need to embrace, and the question is uh, this, which is, do we keep live streaming? Uh, and what about live streaming? Well, there's been a, a difference of opinion. Some clergy have stated, once the pandemic is over and we're able to return to full capacity, we're closing down live streaming because I want people back in church. Others have said, well, you know what? It's a great way to connect the benefits here, to connect with shut-ins, connect with those that are infirmed, travelers from our parish that can uh, connect in and to remain connected with us, and then inquirers, uh, those people that are curious on the Orthodox Church that maybe are a little uh, timid about actually entering uh, an entire liturgy, they can see kind of what they're getting themselves into. Uh, however, there's a downside. And the downside is if we push technology, that could encourage separation from the Eucharist uh, because you know, we can receive that you know, in, live and in person. Uh, it could, the perceptions are that it could teach bad unorthodox behavior. Uh, one, of the, one of the quotes that really stuck with me and one of, a, uh, one of my fellow parishioners shared was that she said, you know, it's going to be really difficult getting back to, to to church on Sundays. Now I've got to get up, I've got to get dressed. And she, got, and she said, I've grown really accustomed to watching, and that's the key operative word there, watching liturgy in my pajamas, eating a bowl of cereal. And that is not the Orthodox experience at all, as you know. But that perception is out there that we've turned into, in some cases, watching liturgy and not experiencing liturgy. So I think the key on live streaming is it has to be part of an overall digital strategy for the parish to figure out how is it gonna be utilized and to what benefit. So also as part of this digital strategy is we have learned digital giving. Some parishes were absolutely far, as far along as you could be on digital giving before the pandemic. Others had to scurry to get it in place but we all saw the benefits. You know, the Lilly Foundation, uh, as part of the, their annual review on religious giving, just came out with their results. And the, as we saw in many of our parishes, the giving levels uh, for churches was very strong uh, this past year. Uh, it had about a three to 4% growth over prior year. Uh, it was one of the marginal levels, uh, social, uh, levels uh, 
and health were the two largest growth sectors in, uh, in fundraising and gifts. But what this showed us is that people, when there was a need, a purpose-driven need, would give. And I think the um, majority of our parishes did see that. Um, I know at my own parish, uh, to use my, my own parish continuous, continuously as an example, we immediately reduced our, our uh, stewardship level during our contingency planning in February, reduced it by about uh, 15%. Uh, at the end of the year, we not only hit our original budget, but exceeded that. And uh, I would say, you know, pleasantly surprised. And I think many parishes went through that same example. But this digital strategy of linking in uh, giving, live streaming the liturgy, and also something that's changed significantly, which is all the connections that we've had with our ministries and our people. Having online uh, Zoom-based parish council meetings, general assemblies, Pelotos meetings, um, clergy ladies, all of these elements that we never thought they would be doing, we fully adopted them. Uh, we've all become Zoomed out. I apologize for you know, using these slides on this Zoom, uh, but uh, and our youth are absolutely telling us that they are tired of Zooming because all of their schooling was that way for the most part. Uh, so we, we've learned a lot in that area and now we're faced with the question, how are we gonna work ourselves forward, either embracing, rejecting, or using some elements of a digital strategy uh, in this case. Some parishes, uh, because I have worked with some parishes during the pandemic on their strategic plans, uh, have embraced an element of digital strategy uh, where they didn't have it previously. Uh, certainly health and safety uh, is going to be a, a continuous awareness for the next unforeseen period. Uh, we do have, and you're probably experiencing your parishes as well. I know in California, we don't have to wear masks, uh, but we still have people that are still concerned and they still wear masks. Uh, and that's fine. It's absolutely fine. And we're going to continue to see that. Uh, so one of the key elements of going forward is we need to meet people where they are not make them come to where we are. And that's a really important element if we're talking about reconnection and re-engagement. You know, we don't have a people problem in our parishes. We don't have a money problem in our parishes. The biggest challenge we have is an engagement problem. Our parishioners have shown us that if we need finances, they can provide it. If there's a compelling reason, they can step forward to remain engaged. People, and the challenge here is on the engagement side of have, figuring out a way to have people reconnect into the parish. That is the challenge. So we have the money, we have the people, we just need to figure out how to keep everybody connected. And I don't mean it in a, in a uh, superficial manner um, in order just to raise funds. It's a very meaningful matter, again, to reconnect first with the Eucharist and to one another. What did we learn during this process? Well, we learned that our parishes can move very fast. Uh, we learned that we can uh, take care of those in need. Uh, parish councils were pulled together rapidly and made rapid decisions. Uh, we floped a host uh, to a large degree uh, because in some cases it wasn't a float host, it was just a special group that formed, took care of those in need, uh, putting together, as I mentioned, calling trees. We connect in ways never before thought possible, as I mentioned before, having Zoom-based meetings and those sort of things. We also learned that we can look beyond our own parish for answers. You know, sometimes we, be very honest with you, take a competitive look sometimes at ourselves versus other parishes. And those barriers drop significantly. In fact, they just were, you know, removed because we started sharing with what worked with Parish A with Parish B, and they were both very open to learn and adapt uh, those responses. Point number five, you know, we were very nim we nimbly responded and we adapted. Uh, as you know, it, it would be a, a couple of days and the CDC would come out some guidelines, and then the next week they would come out some other guidelines, and then maybe your state would come out with some other guidelines, and the city or county that you were in would modify that. So we were very adept to 
uh, adapt and and pivot uh, as as quickly as possible. And we did that very well. And that led into the next thing. Next thing, we were very resilient. And now to look back at your parish and think about all the changes that have occurred over the last 14 months and compare those with all the changes combined that occurred in the prior five years. And I assure you that it's not even close, that these last 14 months have caused us to be very nimble. And we've, we've kept the focus. Yes, it's been hard. Some people have had some difficulties, but we've kept the focus and kept our energy up during this period. And you know, to our, to our clergy, an extremely difficult period as well, but they too um, worked hard and, and as the leaders of the parish. We challenged our own paradigms. We, sh we closed down our Greek festivals, wondering if we'd make it. And then we found out, hey, we survived without a festival. We live stream our worship and we got through it on that. As I mentioned, digital general assemblies, parish council meetings, Bible studies, and certainly online giving as well. We found that people do respond and support a purposeful need. Uh, Rick Warren, the pastor of the mega church out in Southern California, Saddleback, one of the largest in the, in the country, uh, wrote the book on purpose-driven church. And in that, he talks about that you have to have a purposeful need for the funds that you are seeking to uh, ask for. And then a, a, uh, an accounting of what you did. And if people feel that it's a purposeful need, then they will continue to give. And there was you know, a great purposeful need now. We also return to the true essence of our church. And what do I mean by that? Well, you know, when, when, uh, when Christ sent the apostles out, he told, he told them to, to spread the gospel, to bring people to the church. But the church wasn't, you know, a large structure. There weren't any large structures. There weren't parish councils. There weren't a variety of ministries. There were some feeding the homeless, that, and there were the, those in need, and those sort of things. But it isn't like we know it today. And so we returned to our true essence, which was being in one in communion with Christ and taking care of those in need. That's what we return to. And now we don't want to lose that revalidation of our core. Again, our worship, our, our, our faith formation. One of the things that I was also exposed during this period is if you're pre-COVID, if your parish was healthy, it remained healthy. In some cases, it got stronger. But if not, if your parish wasn't healthy, it exposed the wounds. If the parish didn't have, engage, didn't have good engagement, if the parish didn't have a, a good focus on the why of the church, why it exists, then there were some difficulties as well. If the parish didn't trust the leadership, if there were some issues there, well, they didn't trust them more coming out of the gate. So in some cases, we have parishes that are still lingering with those difficulties that they had that were somewhat exacerbated during this period as well. And so one of the things that you have to ask yourself in your parish is where was it pre-COVID and where is it today? Look at that delta and are there things that you need to maintain or to modify quickly? We also have to look at the society in which we are existing. These challenges were there before us and have not gone away. So regarding religion and orthodoxy, looking at the research from Barna, which is a very large research group that does specialize in uh, religious organizations as does Gallup and does a study from the, uh, the Assembly of Canonical Bishops. These are some kind of headlines out of those studies. In 2020, for the first time, 47% of U.S. adults belong to a church, synagogue, or mosque. This is the first time in history, U.S. history, that more people, the majority of the people, have, have not identified with a religious organization. This is the first time those who do identify are in the minority. Contrast that with 1943, 73% of our population identified in 2010, 61% did. So this in itself, from a societal perspective, throws a bit of a roadblock when we're talking about re-engaging our parishioners. 
because some people may have decided to drift into other areas. 40% of millennial youth claim no religious affiliation. 26% of all Orthodox Christians regularly do not attend church on Sundays. Excuse me, only 26% regularly attend church on Sundays, meaning 74% do not. Then 47% of cradle Orthodox unfortunately have left the church. Uh, these again were, especially through Barna, were specific uh, uh, research that was conducted with Orthodox churches. So as you can see, even going into the pandemic, we were challenged uh, as a religion and religion across the United States as well was challenged. As a result of the pandemic, here's some further research which has been done again through Barna and Gallup. During the pandemic, Barna asked a number of people, and by the way, this is combined Orthodox and uh, non-Orthodox. What are the things that they missed about attending in-person worship services? Number one, taking communion. Number two, socializing before and after services. And number three, music to the priest ears, listening to a live sermon. Now, this is interesting because our priests were giving live sermons. Um, I, I will share that my uh, postomino, uh, Father Stephen Siclis, uh, gives wonderful sermons. And during that time, he loves to walk the entire church because he can't stand still. He's got so much energy coming out of him. And when we taped an X on the, on the floor of the Solea and said, you must stand here to give your uh, uh, sermon, he had great difficulty. First of all, the church is empty. He had nobody to look at other than the camera person. And then also he couldn't move because he'd be out of camera range. Uh, and so from that perspective, I would joke with him and say, you're now a televangelist. Uh, but that's kind of what happened. So people wanted to really be that, again, reconnect. But this notion of communion and social socializing we all know this. That I think that speaks for almost everybody on this call. During the course of the pandemic, on average, only three in 10 adult churchgoers had direct contact with their pastors. There was that removal of, again, a live contact uh, with, with, a, with a pastor. Live streaming of services uh, does have a purpose, uh, but cannot replace true, true worship. Now, this was identified, again, by an outside organization. 53% was the typical number of practicing Christians who watch services online. Uh, what does that mean during the pandemic? During the pandemic, a lot of people didn't watch services at all. Again, I use that term watch, but they did not engage in the parish at all. That's one of the things to keep in mind is we kind of assume during that period when, when no one could return to church, that people were engaging online. And the reality is a very large percentage were not. And they have made, may have developed a habit that's going to be difficult to replace. Once the churches began to open, a survey was done of who are the largest groups who have not returned during the, during the in-person worship. And I think you know what this is. Number one, families with children. To a large degree, families with children have absolutely uh, evaporated. They're, they're, you know, they're, think of all the children that are in church on Sundays now. So that is going to be a major challenge. Hopefully in September, uh, that would have been behind us and we can uh, pick up from that. The marginal Orthodox, those that came maybe twice uh, a month, maybe once a month, even once every other month, stop coming. And maybe those are the groups that we're not watching. And one of the ones that, that, to keep an eye on are ministry volunteers. Think about now that you're in, if you are in person, think about all the ministry participants that you've had. This would be people active in your festival, Sunday school teachers, choir members, uh, ushers, if you have a separate usher ministry, if you have a welcome team, all the members of that team, have they all returned? Uh, two days ago, I was speaking to a Sunday school director who is very proactively uh, is now 
by trying to identify and engage with her Sunday school teachers for September. Uh, she sent out an email last uh, about three days ago and immediately found out that three of her core teachers will not be returning, that they've taken this opportunity to kind of step out and they're not going to be back. And so that's one of the things to really keep an eye on is how many of your ministry leaders will indeed be returning or have they actually returned uh, for worship? Uh, this is kind of a, a silent leadership army, if you will, and we want to keep an eye on that. Um, the other group that which is not identified here, which has come up is seniors as well. Uh, seniors that are concerned about their health and have not fully returned because of that. So uh, certainly families, youth, uh, the, the marginal orthodox and the ministry volunteers are all groups to keep an eye on. And then we'll continue to reach out to our seniors to make sure that they are healthy and are getting the emotional support they need uh, as well if they've been shut in for you know, 14 or 15 months. Uh, also, uh, Barna went out and studied the uh, post-COVID church service preferences. This is kind of interesting as well. Uh, this is broken out by age groupings. So we have our Gen Z, which is those less than 24 years old. Millennials, 25 to 40, are also called Gen Y. The Gen Xers, 41 to 56, and the Boomers, 57 to 75, and I'll say 75 and beyond. Now, you can gauge in your own parish what the majority of the people are in your parish. If you have an older parish, it might be more Gen X and Boomers. All of our parishes, remember, 40% of millennials do not identify with a religion, uh, and that would be this area in here. But they asked him, when you go back to church post-COVID, how would you like to go back? 71% well, of the boomers said they want to go back primarily physically. Uh, as you can see, this number drops significantly as you get into people 56 and younger. Um, and that's part of the challenge that we're seeing as well. These age groupings and preference. Now, these are the people that are more technologically connected, uh, and it's more comfortable for them to watch, in you know, that key word, watch liturgy. And the messaging to these groups has, has to be, we're not here to watch liturgy, we're here to engage and participate in liturgy. So as you can see, the boomers, that's, that's, a, that's a target audience that wants to be there. Uh, as a matter of fact, if you looked at this, only 2% want to primarily engage in digital, and 95% you know, are open up to, to both. So as you can see, the majority of, of the boomers are, are fine with going back. Parents, smaller number, why? Well, not because of age, they're in this category as well. Um, and it shows that more males would like to return to worship uh, than a live worship than females. So just something to keep in mind as you're putting together your strategies, and again, you'll have this slide to take a look at. And you can also go to Barna's website. Uh, if you search through Barna, you can find these results. So why return? Well, there's a lot of benefits to stay home. It saves time and gas. I get there when I want to get there. If I want to see a re replay at 11 o'clock at night, I can watch them. There's no dress code. I can stay in my pajamas. And Now, don't get me wrong. And, and I apologize if I'm giving this impression. There are individuals that took this very seriously, that did try as they could to engage. And I don't have this digitally, uh, but here is a here is a photograph that I just speaks volumes. This is a, a picture, and I, I'm trying trying to be boastful, and I apologize if it comes across that way. But this is a, a camera just happened to catch this. This is a picture of my two grandchildren. Uh, Nicholas now is nine, so he was eight in this photo, and his little sister was about a little over two and a half. And this is what they were doing during the great entrance. They were engaged. And I keep this with me to remind me that there are many who remained engaged. So, 
I, I don't want to give this negative perception that all people were eating cereal and watching. There were people that were very engaged during this process. And I think many of our parishes asked early on, how are you staying engaged? How are you experiencing worship in your parish as well? But if somebody doesn't want to return, there's no guest, uh, dress code. They always have a good seat. Uh, they can record it and watch it later. And they don't have to worry about their children making too much noise. Um, if you look at the divine liturgy as, as performance art, well, the hymns are beautiful. I can still experience those, although there was really no choirs per se, but I, I'm experiencing the chanter. Uh, interior can be visually appealing. I can still hear the gospel. I can still learn. And I can appreciate viewing. Uh, I Some parishes had multi-camera systems with uh, you know, the ability to switch from cameras depending on what, what was being said and they could pan over to a, you know, an icon or whatever the case might be. So they did kind of make it performance art to some degree, uh, trying to enhance the experience. But is there something more? Well, yeah, there's communion, but you know what? If that's all I'm thinking about as well, I can make an appointment and receive communion. Those parishes did that. Uh, or I can even time my arrival. Uh, if, if there are some parishes that did move communion to the tail end of liturgy, so people could receive and then exit to reduce congestion, I can just show up then. So those are all kind of the wrong reasons, right? Um, you know, the reasons are that, you know, Jesus taught his disciples that for two or three gathered in my name, I am there in the midst of them. Um, you know, during the Last Supper, do this in remembrance of me, where he broke bread and shared the common cup. Uh, in Hebrews, let us not consider how to stir up one another, excuse me, and let us consider how to stir one up, one more time, and let us consider how to stir up one another to love and do good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more you see the day drawing near. Even at that, it said that not neglecting to be together, as is the habit of some. The church worships it together. We're physically present. We're gathered to one place. That's what we're called to do, not just watch, not just to listen. We come together in faith to thank and worship our Lord and Savior in this beautiful dialogue with clergy and laity. Remind, this, you know, be remind one another that when we hear crisis in our midst, we respond and say, he is and always shall be. We're a congregation. We're not an audience. We can never be an audience. That's why we have to be together. So how do we, how do we reconnect? Well, there's a couple of uh, kind of simple, kind of blocking and tackling, if you will. Now, first of all, trusting in the Lord, right? As I mentioned before, the church has been challenged throughout its history. And this is another challenge. And we too will, will get through this. And we're called upon now as leaders, as participants, as worshipers to come together and to help the church uh, reemerge, if you will. Again, I don't mean that the church ever went away, uh, but to re-engage with our parishioners and make them feel comfortable to come in. You know, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. Jeremiah 29, 11. With that in mind, let's talk about some things we can do. Three things. First of all, form a reconnection team. I'll talk about each one of these in a little bit of detail. The second one is develop a plan. And the third one is to develop, take out a developed plan and implement it with intentionality. Looking back at our inverse belt curve, we had to become very intentional on how we were gonna manage through the pandemic. Again, we reduced our budgets, we reconnected, we had phone trees set up, we did a variety of things. That was very intentional, we had to do that. And that's what kind of helped us through the, 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 the real doldrums and, and the challenges and, and the, um, the winter year, the, the winter season. With that same intentionality, we come out of it. We plan, 
we execute and we support. So first thing is form a reconnection team. This team should be, I'm recommending, is built of about eight to 12 very engaged parishioners or ministry leads. Certainly it's gonna involve the Christ Domino, parish council president. If you had a parish health officer, many parishes did, I would include that person as well, because health and safety is still an issue, still a concern. The float to host president, some of your parish council members. And if you have an office administrator or a facilities manager, they should be included as well. Uh, because our facilities, in some cases, haven't still fully reopened. Um, we have been challenged, and there's a fear in the back of many people's minds that the pandemic will rear its head, that a variant will come forward. The Delta variant is the one you probably heard the most of, will come forward and become widespread again. Certainly the amount of vaccinations uh, will hopefully stifle that. Uh, we're not sure if we need booster shots. We still have a lot of unknown period. So there's people still afraid there. But this reconnection team needs to understand all that. That's why you need to have a parish health officer and your facility manager. And the focus is to build and implement a reconnection plan. So also the key behind this is number one, having a lead because with a lead, with team members, you have accountability and the team should have that accountability. Uh, the next thing you're gonna do is develop a plan. Any plan has certain design principles. Number one, linking to the why. Why does the parish exist? Parish exists to draw people to Christ, to draw people to the Eucharist, to connect through our worship and our acts of kindness and, to, and our, our faith formation. Understand the audience. We talked a little bit about our audience a few minutes ago. I'm gonna give you a little bit more information on that in just a second. Make your plan simple and concise. Don't be over elaborate. Make it really understandable and then start now. Get your, if you don't have a plan in place, put one together and put it together in the next 10 days. Why 10 days? Because at the beginning of this, in April of last year, in February of last year, that was about the average. Parishes were putting together plans in about 10 days because they could, remember, quick, nimble, adaptive. We can still do that, let's not lose that. Assign tasks, just like we did before, have accountability, and have some fun. Be creative, enjoy one another's presence. So anything that you do, incorporate these design elements. From an action perspective, I, re I recommend four elements. First one is to reinvigorate or establish a welcome team, a form of de dedicated welcome ministry that's friendly and engaging. Put people are there that like to smile. Now, again, some people may be a little bit nervous about touching, but, and I would assume the majority of people are not wearing masks as you'd be. I do not put this in the narthex, put it outside uh, so people can see smiles. Uh, but, you know, even if people want to wear a mask, uh, I was at a parish last Sunday, their welcome team lead had a mask on because she's not vaccinated and, and didn't want to take out her mask. Absolutely fine. But her eyes certainly said hello. Uh, have some to-go information packets for inquirers. Uh, I think most of our parishes are putting books and pamphlets uh, back out for people. Uh, and the research, research has shown that it's not transmitted uh, that, in that manner. So I have some you know, scale down packets or something to give people. Um, if they're comfortable, some parishes have, have worship buddies, if you will, for those inquirers or those marginal Orthodox that haven't returned for a while to offer to have somebody just kind of checking up on them, maybe even sitting in close proximity so they could describe what the liturgy is about. And this also includes ushers. I really recommend, cannot recommend it uh, more to have an usher ministry outside of your parish council members. The usher ministry is a wonderful way to bring people into the parish, give them a little job. You have them on a rotational cycle. So maybe they usher once every three weeks. In my particular parish, 
They usher, we have six teams. You usher once every six weeks. So, and we, we train them. And, and in fact, our usher ministry is over 60 people. So, you know, whatever your size, proportionally, just doesn't have to be your parish council members. It's a great way to have everybody working to welcoming people and helping people. The next one is connect, form a connection team, a very specific sub team, a connection team. Calls, letters, notes, contact lists, tracking, all these elements can give you information. Um, review your stewardship list. Who's been here? Who haven't we seen for a while? I guarantee if you looked at a stewardship list from a year and a half ago or two years ago, you'll realize that a lot of those people have kind of fallen through the cracks. And it gives you a, a target, if you will, of who you should contact and check in with. If you have a parish directory, open up your parish directory and look at the pictures. You may not know the names, but you'll know the faces. And go, that's right, we have not seen this person for a long period of time. Now, one of the things that I'm always impressed with is the amount of knowledge that our clergy have uh, with their flocks. And so they can tell you who uh, you can go to, uh, who maybe is not the right time for whatever reasons. Um, activate local small groups. Uh, people, if you're connected with people in the parish, the likelihood of returning, it grows much higher. If you have thought about initiating small groups, and these can be through ministries, through special interest groups, or whatever the case might be, could even be by zip code, um, but initiate some small groups, get people connected. Uh, when you're when you're messaging, ask people to join for worship. You know you're you're kind of starting new. If you haven't been, come join us. That's what churches do. That's what we're called to do. Uh, tell people that they're missed. Uh, and you know, for every person that's not there, they are truly missed. Whether we can really articulate it, but when we, I guarantee, if you go through your lists and you go through your uh, parish directories you're going to see some names and it's going to hit you that I, I've missed that, this person. I've forgotten about it. Uh, contact more than once. You know, some people say you got to hear a message 10 times before you get it. You know, I'm, I'm uh, the adage, you know, tell them what you're going to tell them, tell them, tell them what you told them. And then I always had, and tell them one more time. Matter of fact, tell them so many times that they're going to say, okay, I got it. Then I know that they've got the message. Is it five times, four times, 10 times? I don't know. It depends on the person. But figure you're gonna to have to contact them more than one time. Use a multimedia approach. Remessage your website. Have a major element of your website saying you're missed. If you'd like to contact you, if you don't have any questions, please, you know, send an email, call us, open that, open that door wide open on your on your website. Uh, certainly call, certain emails as well. Now, not to the point of harassment. We all are not enjoying uh, the amount of robocalls we're getting from time to time, but it's caring and people will pick that up. In that conversation, there was a master at one parish. Uh, he contacted close to 600 people uh, during the pandemic. And it was an individual you never would have thought of, but he was the master of about a 15 to 30 second check-in call. And he always ended it by saying, we love you. And it was heartfelt. So figure out a way. Welcome, connect. The next element is celebrate. We are a very hospitable group. We love celebrating. We love um, feeding one another. We love, we just love that element of it. That was taken away from us. Um, as soon as you can, have a parish luncheon. Fine. You don't have to any reason to say we're just going to get together. Now, state by state, it varied when we could open up coffee hours, that sort of thing. In my parish, we are only on our third coffee hour uh, that we've had during this entire pandemic, and people have just been, you know, coming out of their, you know, coming unglued uh, uh, with the excitement and 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 happiness in their faces as you're able to, to reconnect with the coffee hour. Last Sunday, we had the Georges celebrated. Now we missed St. George, uh, and because usually we would have a little bit of a 
small feast day expanded coffee hour uh, that they would always put on, but they said, we're going to do it. So they had the George's uh, coffee hour and all the George's in the parish sponsored the coffee hour. And uh, now we've got, you know, I didn't leave this, but now somebody wants to do it for St. Stephen and all the Steves get together. That's fun. Just have some fun with it. Um, so, we, and, you know, there are some individuals that, you know, wanted to have uh, their marriage blessed for their 50th anniversary or 20th anniversary of their marriage that were all missed. Go back. They're going to go back and have those. So it's okay to kind of do a little bit of catch up to, to celebrate and recognize that we're still here together uh, as a family. And, and that's okay. It's okay to have fun. Um, and then simplify. You know, some of our prisoners have been gone. If it's a marginal prisoner, they've been gone for a while. We might have inquirers through live streaming that are interested in, in visiting us. Uh, I always encourage this as part of the strategic planning process, but certainly now as well. Take the visitor walk. Take the visitor walk from driving up the street before you come into your parking lot and take a look as a visitor would take a look. I know it's hard because you're so familiar, but think about how would somebody that's not familiar with our parish or has been gone a long time uh, view our parish? Um, what does our facility look like? Is it old? Is it run down? What is it projecting from the street? As we're pulling in, is our parking lot in good repair? Uh, but more importantly, do we have signage that says, here's how you get to the front door? Uh, and, you know, through the architecture of our, many of our buildings, sometimes we have very large, ominous, old front doors that uh, I was one parish that I, that I was visiting. And, you know, I'm very, I've been Orthodox quite a long time. And, uh, and I was nervous walking in because uh, it was not octagonal shape and, and they had these huge doors and no one was at the door as a greeter and the door even creaked when I opened it up. So I can imagine if I was somebody coming there for the first time, I, I don't know if I had walked in, but walk through, take a look as a new visitor and then think about where we could strategically place greeters even away from the front door to answer any questions or direct people. Um, and I have read the doors, the doors, that's, that's what I was talking about, not to keep people out during that time of the liturgy, but to be cognizant of that, you know, have a, have a greeter opening the door for somebody, welcoming them in, as opposed to have somebody put their hand on the door and open it up that they're not sure where they're going to go. And also have a coffee hour sponsor. Uh, again, some, some parishes do this extremely well, at least they, they did in the past, where they uh, would, would greet somebody, and I'm sure many of your parishes that are on this call do this as well. And you have individuals, but maybe they haven't done it for a while. But have that person that, that kind of facilitates the, the visitor through coffee hour, sometimes even showing them where coffee hour is. So, uh, you know, do these four things, right? Put it within your plan, you know, have a welcome element, have a defined connection plan, asking, welcoming people, have a plan to celebrate and enjoy each other's companies, and then simplify, use signage to uh, reduce any obstacles or barriers uh, that could be out there because we have lived in a period of obstacles and barriers being put in front of us. The next is you wanna implement with intentionality. This is where it gets a little bit um, more specific. Many times when we put together plans, we put them together for everybody, one size fits all. Well, remember that slide I showed you with, with Barna group showing that millennials have a different perspective than Gen Xers and you know, baby boomers and that sort of thing. So this is a model that again was drawn up by, initially by Rick Warren at Saddleback Church in his book, Purpose Driven Church, and identifies five groups in a parish. Should your team want to do this, you could actually design plans around each one of these groups. The core, fully engaged parishioners, they've probably have been there in some form. And certainly as soon as the doors open, they came back and it's the kind of the usual suspects that are always there. The committed, these are people that have some ministry involvement or are usually fairly regular in their attendance at, at, at liturgy. 
uh, but uh, not as committed as the core members, but active in the parish. And then we have a congregation, those people that come to liturgy once or twice a month. And then we have what's being called the crowd, really the unchurched Orthodox, right? Uh, Orthodox, if you will, kind of by name only, by baptism. Uh, and, you know, Christmas and Easter, possibly. But those are the people that will require a little different strategy. And then the non-Orthodox inquirers coming from the surrounding community. And so you can, when I had the to-go package, the to-go materials, that really was targeted for the community and the crowd. Um, so, you know, somebody from the core group obviously is not going to be, you know, need a buddy checking in on them or helping them with uh, coffee hour. So there are nuances of this as well. And you can actually put together plans for each of these uh, areas. Uh, you also, it's okay to track, right? If you have a list of people they haven't seen for a while, track to see if they're coming back because that will make a difference. Nothing is more powerful than if you do a follow-up call to somebody after they've attended with your opening saying, it's nice to see you back. Recognizing that they were recognized in church and we appreciate that. Again, please, thank you. We appreciate it, all those elements uh, to, to return. So putting it together to plan with the context of this. Finally, the most important is knowing that in our entire journey, that Christ is with us. Uh, is, uh, this is you know, a given, but you know, opening ourselves up, praying for discernment, praying for uh, energy, wisdom, guidance, uh, and, a, and a, a, again, an energy to maintain a focus during these times. Um, if we can appreciate where we've been through the, con through the context, understand the lessons that we've learned, apply those lessons to our unique situations in each one of our parishes, and then put together some active, engaged plans to ultimately re-engage with people, to encourage them to return to worship, then that's ultimately a good start. Uh, it's an excellent start. The key then will be to continue through fellowship and continued engagement to uh, keep the doors open, keep the people coming into the doors. So with that, I will now stop the formal presentation. I'm sorry we ran a little bit late, uh, but uh, I will be happy to answer any questions that you might have. If we have one question that came in uh, on the chat, um, actually now we have another. Um, the question was, um, the quote says, activate local small groups and uh, is the primary purpose social connection of the small groups? Um, it, the, well, the, the, the primary is always around Christ. So I think that the, any small group, the, the reason we're there is to connect with one another as fellow Christians, as fellow Orthodox Christians. That's the first step. The second step then is within that context, then to be connected. Now, what I'm what I what I don't mean to say is that every group, every meeting has to be a Bible study. Um, remember the Barna study said the two things that were missing is communion and socialization. But as long as we have an element of opening with a prayer, uh, discussions around the context of the church, and then, then just socializing. If, if you look outside the Orthodox Church, the notion of small groups, uh, certainly within the Protestant evangelical, and I'm not saying that we're you know, going to become Protestant or evangelical, but there are things that they do very well. And what they do very well is small groups. Uh, connecting people either around a common interest or a uh, locale. Uh, and it can be a you know, small, just reading a passage in the Bible or whatever the case might be. But again, we're a church. We can never forget Christ, but that does not have to be the composition of the entire meeting. 
Thank you, Steve. That was helpful. Um, another question is, is there any language or key words that um, you or your parish found helpful in encouraging people to come back? Love. Uh, you know, love in our, in our approach, love in our understanding, uh, seeking to understand the other person first. So probably understanding um, is probably is, is really, but the, the key word is, that, that drives us. Matter of fact, in, in my own parish, um, that's, that's what we embrace uh, is that uh, we're there you know, to love one another as St. Paul uh, shared. So uh, that was, that's probably so the same. So you avoid the you should language, maybe we missed you kind of language instead. Or we missed you and instead of you should be back in church kind of language. Um, oh yeah, we, we never see, yeah, I've, I've never seen the word should. <laughs> Good, okay. Yeah. Um, let's see here. Um, you know, and, and, I, and, and it's, it's a combination, if I can't find it, it's a combination of words, but it's actions as well. Mm -hmm. You know, it's the smile, it's, it's something as, as simple as a, as a greeter opening the door and saying hello to each person as they come in with a smile on their face. Just little things like that. It's, you know, it's, it's picking up the phone and doing a, a small, quick check-in call. How you doing? Um, it, those actions, for the actions speaking louder than words, are very, very uh, powerful. I think that's a great point. It's a person-to-person -person process. And I think when they walk through the door, even before they walk through the door, if we can show them that we're glad they're back and welcome them back and make it an easy process. Um, I, I think you've got the key there. Um, let's see one more question here. I'm assuming that a balanced approach has to be used in a general message to avoid those in the core group that have been in attendance that we want, that we have loved seeing them a while. Okay, so hold on, let me try this again those in the core group that have been in attendance that we have loved seeing them while we want to encourage more to reconnect. Um, sure about that. Yeah, so there, there's gonna be different types of messaging. You know, the, the I'll, I'll say the Sunday bulletin messaging. Sunday mm -hmm. bulletin messaging is, is kind of a one size fits all. Uh, for those of you that, it, yeah, it, it's, 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 a, it's a fine line. But yes, um, it's encouragement, encouraging everyone to be there and um, being respectful of where they're starting from. You know, one, one of the key elements of this is understand that we have to start where the person is coming from. And that gets, uh, in some cases, we embrace a very traditional European worship style of a very large church, very large doors, beautiful imagery, iconography inside the church. Therefore, we open the doors and you, you come. You come in. We are here for you. This is taking that, but adding an approach, not subtracting, but adding an approach of going to where the person is and saying, come. Right, and and that's a very important element because every no no two people are starting from the same spot right now. There are individuals that have been horribly stricken during this pandemic, have had uh, you know unbelievable grief of losing uh, friends and, and loved ones. Um, there may be people on this call that were stricken with COVID. Uh, certainly, we all know someone that you know had contracted it. Uh, and, you know, that's, that's the physical side. Uh, emotionally, people confined, becoming fearful. So people are all over the place. So we have to be, yes, we can have general messages, um, but we have to ultimately on that one-on-one, -on -one, that person-to-person, -person, seek to understand where that person's coming from so we can connect, because if not, they're just going to be listening to us, listening to what we want to say, as opposed to us listening to them and, and understanding the obstacles 
and the barriers coming forward. There's, there's one very devout individual who is extremely afraid and she's late fifties um, and is, um, has a couple children, but she, she just said, I'm not taking my mask off and I'm not sure I will ever take my mask off. It has been vaccinated as well and uh, maintains a very significant social distancing. Uh, well, you know what we could either say you're wrong or you should take your mask off because you're not gonna, or we just appreciate through love what she's going through and we're there for her and we will try to adapt as, as best we can. Yeah. Good answer. Um, last question, because we need to wrap up here to be respectful of people's time. Um, who should be on the re-engagement team? So um, the, uh, as I mentioned, certainly the plus domino. Uh, and then if you have a health officer, uh, because we're still not fully out of this yet. So it's good to have the health officer there as a frame of reference. But ultimately, you want people that are connected to the parish and know people. Because this is all about person to person connections. So it could be members of the parish council. I would say Philoptohos should be there. If Philoptohos has been your primary response mechanism for people in need, uh, because you may find out cases where people do need something uh, that I would have a, a either president or a key member of Floptos uh, on this team. Uh, certainly people that uh, you know, know a lot of people and know how to connect through communications. Whoever manages your communications, whether it's an office administrator, that's another reason why I put that name there. Um, or if you have a, a, a communications lead for the parish, I'd put that person. But ultimately, people that know people, know a lot of people in the parish and are outgoing and are comfortable uh, talking to people. That's probably the, the attribute that is, is, is uh, well, second attribute that's most keenly needed. The other one, obviously, is they should already have been engaged in the worship life of the parish as well, because they can use themselves as an example. Again, not to be, uh, you know, arrogant, but uh, they want to be inviting people to worship, which means they should be in worship as well. Uh, so you don't want to have somebody that hasn't attended liturgy or doesn't regularly attend liturgy on the welcome team because it could look um, disingenuous by inviting someone back when they themselves don't attend liturgy. Great. I'm going to turn this over to Stacy now to wrap up and talk about next next uh, meeting or two. Sure. Thanks, Father Jim. Thank you for, for stepping in for me. Uh, my technological challenges are still challenging, so thank you very much. Um, thank you, Steve, for your time this evening and for offering this presentation. I'm getting the sense from a lot of messages and texts that the information presented was invaluable tonight. Um, so thank you both. And before I let everybody go, um, I want to remind you all that we're going to take July off. Um, we're not going to have a meeting on the fourth Thursday of July. So our next one will be the fourth Thursday of August. Um, I wish you all a blessed summer and a wonderful summer, one where you can enjoy just about everything you'd like, whether that's family, vacation, whatever the case may be. Um, Father Dean Kokanis, are you still on the call? He was a moment ago. Um, Father Jim, I'm, I'm not hearing him or getting an answer from him. Do you mind? Would you just go ahead and close us in prayer? Sure, I will. Thank you. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Lord Jesus Christ, our God, we thank you for this opportunity to gather, even virtually, to plan and to serve your church, always bringing people to you and giving the glory back to you. All these things we pray in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank all you, everybody. Stacy, Stacey, I'll, 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 I'll send you these slides, Stacy, by the way. Perfect. Okay. Thank you so much.
All right. Good night. Bye. Good night, everybody. Stay safe. Good night.